back at the silver chair, the house of Harfang. Go and pull, do your stuff, whispered Scrub. Jill found that her mouth was so dry that she couldn't speak a word. She nodded savagely at Scrub, thinking to himself that he would never forgive her or puddle them either. Scrub licked his lips and shouted up to the king, the king giant. If you please, sire, the lady of the green curtain will salute you by us and said you'd like to have us for your autumn fest feast. The giant king and queen looked at each other, nodded at each other, and smiled in a way that Jill didn't exactly like. She liked the king better than the queen. She had a fine curled, he had a fine curled beard and a straight eagle-like nose and was really rather good looking as giants go. The queen was dreadfully fat and had a double chin and a fat powdered face, which isn't a very nice thing at the best of times and of course looks much worse when it is 10 times too big. Then the king put out his tongue and licked his lips. Anyone might do that but his tongue was so very large and red and came out so unexpectedly that it gave Jill quite a shock. Oh, what good children, said the queen. Perhaps she's the nice one after all, thought Jill. Yes, indeed, said the king. Quite excellent children. We welcome you to our court. Give me your hands. He stretched out his big right, his, his great right hand, very clean and with an, any number of fingers on the feet any number of rings on the fingers, but also with terrible pointed nails. He was much too big to shake hands with the children. In turn, he was much too big to shake the hands, which the children in turn helped up to, held up to him. But he shook, their, he shook the arms. And what's that? asked the king, pointing to Puddle Glum. Brush Piggle Biggle, said Puddle Glum. Oh, screamed the queen, gathering her skirts close about her ankles. The horrid thing, it's alive! He's quite all right, your majesty, really he is, said Scrub hastily. You'll like him much better when you get to know him, I'm sure you will. I hope you won't lose all interest in Jill for the rest of the book, if I tell you that at this moment she began to cry. There was a good deal of excuse for her. Her feet and hands and ears and nose were still only just beginning to fall, Melted snow was tickling off, trickling off her clothes. She had had hardly anything to eat or drink that day, and her legs were aching so that she felt she could not go on standing much longer. Anyways, it did more good at the moment than anything else would have done, for the queen said, Oh, the poor child. My lord, we do wrong to keep our guests standing. Quick, some of you, take them away, give them food and wine and baths, comfort the little girl, give her lollipops, give her dolls, give her physics, give her all you can think of. Possets and comforts and caraways and lullabies and toys. Don't cry, little girl, or you won't be good for anything when the feast comes. Jill was just as indignant as you and I would have been at the mention of toys and dolls, and though lollipops and comforts might be all very well in their way, she very much hoped that something more solid would be provided. The Queen's foolish speech, however, produced excellent results, for Puddle Glum and Scrub were at once picked up by giant gentlemen in waiting and Jill by a gigantic maid of honor and carried off to their rooms. Jill's room was about the size of a church and would have been rather grim if it had not been had a roaring fire on the hearth and very thick crimson carpet on the floor. And here delightful things began to happen to her. She was handed over to the queen's old nurse, who was, for the giant's point, from the giant's point of view, a very little old woman, almost bent double with age, and, from the human point of view, a giantess small enough to go about an ordinary room without knocking her head on the ceiling. She was very capable, though Jill did not, though Jill did wish she wouldn't keep on cluck, clicking her tongue and saying things like "Ooh la la, oopsie daisy," and "There's a duck," and. Now we'll be all right, my puppet. She filled the giant foot bath with hot water and helped Jill into it. If you can swim as Jill could, a giant bath is a lovely thing. And giant towels, though a bit rough and coarse, are lovely too, because they are, there are acres of them. In fact, you don't need to dry at all. You just roll about on them in front of the fire and enjoy yourself. And when that was over, uh, was over clean fret. When that was over, clean, fresh, warmed clothes were put on Jill. Very splendid clothes and a little too big for her, but clearly made for humans, not giantesses. I suppose if that woman in the green kirtle comes here, they must be used to guests of our size, thought Jill. 
She soon saw that she was right about this, for a table and a chair of the right height for an ordinary grown-up human were placed for her, and the knives and forks and spoons were the proper size, too. It was delightful to sit down, feeling warm and clean at last. Her feet were still bare, and it was lovely to tread on the giant carpet. She sank in it well over her ankles, and it was just the thing for sore feet. The meal, which I suppose we must call dinner, though it was nearer tea time, was a cock a leaky, a cock -a -leaky soup, and hot roast turkey, and a steamed put pudding, and roast chestnuts, and as much fruit as you could eat. The only annoying thing was that the nurse kept coming in and out. Every time she came in, she brought a gigantic toy with her, a huge doll, bigger than Jill herself, a wooden horse on wheels about the size of an elephant, a drum that looked like a giant gasometer, and a woolly lamb. They were crude, badly made things, painted in very bright colors, and Jill hated the sight of them. She kept, telling, kept on telling the nurse she didn't want them, but the nurse said, Tut, 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 you want him all right when you had a bit of rest, I know. <laughs> Beanie bye now, a precious puppet. The bed was not a giant bed, but only a big four-poster like what you might see in an old-fashioned hotel, and very small it looked in the enormous room. She was very glad to tumble into it. Is it still snowing, nurse? she asked sleepily. Raining now, Ducky, said the giantess. Rain will wash away all nasty snow. Precious Puppet will be able to go out and play tomorrow. And she tucked Jill up and said good night. I know nothing so dis disagreeable as being kissed by a giantess. Jill thought the same, but was asleep in five minutes. The rain fell steadily all that evening and all the night dashing against the windows of the castle, and Jill never heard it, but slept deeply past supper time and past midnight. And then came the deadest hour of the night, and nothing stirred but mice in the house of the giants. At that hour there came to Jill a dream. It seemed to her that she awoke in the same room and saw the fire. Sunk low and red, and in the firelight the great wooden horse, and the horse came of its own will, rolling on its wheels across the carpet, and stood at her head. Now it was no longer a horse, but a lion as big as the horse. And then it was not a toy lion, but a real lion. The real lion, just as she had seen him on the mountain beyond the world's end. And a smell of all sweet-smelling things there are filled the room. But there was some trouble in Jill's mind, though she could not think what it was. And the tears streamed down her face and wet the pillow. The lion told her to repeat the signs, and she found that she had forgotten them all. At that, a great whore came over to her, and Aslan took her up in his jaws. She could feel his lips and his breath, but not his teeth, and carried her to the window and made her look out. The moon shone bright in and hidden in great letters, and written in great letters across the world or the sky, she did not know which, were the words, Under me. After that, the dream faded away, and when she woke very late next morning, she did not remember that she had dreamed at all. She was up and dressed and all, had finished breakfast in front of a fire when the nurse opened the door and said, Here's pretty puppets, little friends, come to play with her. In came Scrub and the marsh wiggle. Hello, good morning, said Jill. Isn't this fun? I've slept about fifteen hours. I believe I do feel better, don't you? I do, said Scrub, but Puddleglum says he has a headache. Hello. Your window has a window seat. If we got up on that, we could see out. And at once they all did so, and at the first glance, Jill said, Oh, how perfectly dreadful. The sun was shining, and, and except for a few drifts, the snow had been almost completely washed away by the rain. Down below them, spread out like a map, lay the flat hilltop which they had struggled over yesterday afternoon, Seen from the castle, it could not be mistaken for anything but the ruins of a gigantic city. It had been flat, as Jill now saw, because it was still, on the whole, paved, though in places the pavement was broken. The crisscross banks were what was left of the walls of huge buildings, which might once have been giants', giants palaces and temples. On one bit of wall, about 500 feet high, was still standing. It was that which she had thought was a cliff. The things that had looked like, a fact, like factory chimneys were enormous pillars broken off at unequal heights. Their fragments lay at their bases like felled trees of monstrous stone. 
the ledges which they had climbed down on the north side of the hill, and also, no doubt, the, the other ledges which they had climbed up on the south side were the remaining steps of giant stairs. To crown all, in large dark lettering across the center of the pavement ran the words, Under me. The three travelers looked at each other in dismay, and after a short whistle, Scrub said what they were all thinking. The second and third signs muffed. At that moment, Jill's dream rushed back into her mind. It's my fault, she said in a despairing tone. I I'd given up repeating the signs every night. If I'd been thinking about them, I could have seen it was the city even in all that snow. I'm worse, said Puddleglum. I did see, or nearly, I thought it looked uncommonly like a ruined city. You're the only one who isn't to blame, said Scrub. You did try to make us stop. Didn't try hard enough, though, said the Marsh Wiggle. And I'd no call to be trying. I ought to have done it, as if I couldn't have stopped you two with one hand each. The truth is, said Scrub, we were so jolly keen on getting to this place that we weren't bothered bothering about anything else. At least I know I was. Ever since that, we met that woman with the knight who didn't talk. We'd been thinking of nothing else. We'd nearly forgotten about Prince Rillian. I shouldn't wonder, said Puddleglum, if that wasn't exactly what she intended. But I don't quite understand, said Jill. Is what I don't quite understand, said Jill, is how we didn't see the lettering, or could it have been come there since last night? Could he, Aslan, have put it there in the night? I had such a queer dream, and she told them all about it. Why, you chump, said Scrub. We did see it. We got into the lettering, don't you see? We got into the letter E in me. That was your sunk lane. We walked along the bottom stroke of the E, due north, turned to it, to our right along the upright, came to another turn to the right, that's the middle stroke, and then went on to the top left-hand corner, or, if you like, the northeastern corner of the letter, and came back. Like the valley idiots we are. He kicked the window seat savagely and went on. So it's no good, Paul. I know what you were thinking because I was thinking the same. You were thinking how nice it would have been if Aslan hadn't put the instructions on the stones of the ruined city till after we'd passed it. And then it would have been his fault, not ours. So likely, isn't it? No, we must just own up. We've only four signs to go by, and we've muffed the first three. You mean I have, said Jill. It's quite true. I've spoiled everything ever since you brought me here. All the same, I'm frightfully sorry, and all that. All the same, what are the instructions? Under me doesn't seem to make much sense. Yes, it does, though, said Puddleglum. It means we've got to look for the prince under the city. But how can we, asked Jill? That's the question, said Puddleglum, rubbing his big frog-like hands together. How can we now? No doubt if we'd had our minds on our, on our job when we were at the Renuous City, we'd have been shown how. Found a little door or a cave or a tunnel, met someone to help us, might have been, you never know, Aslan himself. We'd have do got down under those paving stones somehow or other. Aslan's instructions always work. There are no exceptions, but how to do it now, that's another matter. Well, we shall just have to go back, I suppose, said Jill. Easy, isn't it, said Puddleglum. We might try opening that door to begin with. And they all looked at the door and saw that none of them could reach the handle, and that almost certainly no one could turn it if they did. Did you think they'd... Do you think they won't let us out if we ask, said Jill? And nobody said, but everyone thought, supposing they don't. It was not a pleasant idea. Puddleglum was dead against any idea of telling the giants their real business and simply asking to be let out, and of course the children couldn't tell without his permission because they had promised, and all three felt pretty sure that there would be no chance of escaping from the castle by night. Once they were in their rooms with the door shut, they would be prisoners till morning. They might, of course, ask to have their doors left open, but that would rouse suspicions. Our only chance, said Scrub, is to try to sneak away by daylight. Mightn't there be an hour in the afternoon when most of the giants are asleep? 
And if we could steal down into the kitchen, mightn't there be a back door open? It's hardly what I call a chance, said the Marsh Wiggle, but it's all the chance we're likely to get. As a matter of fact, Scrub's plan was not quite so hopeless as you might think. If you want to get out of a house without being seen, the middle of the afternoon is in some way a better time to try to try it than the middle of the night. Doors and windows are more likely to be open, and if you are caught, you could always pretend you, were, you weren't meaning to go far and had no particular plans. It is very hard to make either giants or grown-ups believe this if you are found climbing out of bedroom window, a bedroom window at one o'clock in the morning. We, we must put them off their guard, though, said Scrub. We must pretend we love being here and are longing for this autumn feast. That's tomorrow night, said Puddleglum. I heard one of them say so. I see, said Jill. We must pretend to be awfully excited about it and keep on asking questions. They think we're absolute infants anyway, which will make it easier. Gay, said Puddleglum with a deep sigh. That's what we've got to be, gay, as if we hadn't a care in the world. Frolicsome, you two youngsters haven't, haven't always got very high spirits, I've noticed. You must watch me and do as I do. I'll be gay, like this, and he assumed a ghastly grin. And frolicsome, here he cut a most mournful caper. You'll soon get into it if you keep your eyes on me. They think I'm a funny fellow already, you see. I dare say you two thought I was a trifle tipsy last night, but I do assure you it was, well, most of it was put on. I had an idea it would come in useful somehow. The children, when they talked over their adventures afterwards, could never feel sure whether this last statement was quite strictly true, but they were sure that Puddleglum thought it was true when he made it. All right, gay's the word, said Scrub. Now, if we could only get someone to open the door. While we're fooling about and being gay, we've got to find out all we can about this castle. Gay is an old word, an old English word, meaning very uplifting and upspirited and, and happy. Luckily, at that very moment, the door opened and the giant nurse bustled in, saying, Now, my puppets, like to come and see the king and all the court setting out on the hunting. Such a pretty sight. They lost no time, rushing out past her and climbing down the first staircase they came to. The noise of hounds and horns and giant voices guided them so that in a few minutes they reached the courtyard. The giants were all on foot, for there are no giant horses in that part of the world, and the giants' hunting is done on foot, like beagling in England. The hounds also were of normal size. When Jill saw that there were no horses, she was at first dreadfully disappointed, for she felt sure that the great fat queen would never go after hounds on foot, and it would never do to have her about the house all day. But then she saw the queen in a kind of litter supported on the shoulders of six giant young giants. The silly old creature was all got up in green and had a horn at her side. Twenty or thirty giants, including the king, were assembled ready for the sport, all talking and laughing fit to deafen you. And down below, nearer Jill's level, there was level. There was a wagging. There were wagging tails and barking and and loose slobbery mouths and noses of dogs thrust into your hand. Puddleglum was just beginning to strike what he thought a gay and gamesome attitude, which might have spoiled everything. If it had not, if it had been noticed, when Jill put on her most attractively childish smile, rushed across to the king's litter and shouted up to the queen, Oh, please, you're not going away, are you? You will come back. Yes, my dearie, said the queen, I'll be back tonight. Oh, good, how lovely, said Jill, and we may come to the feast tomorrow night, mayn't we? We're so longing for tomorrow night, and we love, we love you. And we do love being here, and while you're out, we may run over the whole castle and see everything, mayn't we? Do say yes. The queen did say yes, but the laughter of all the courtiers nearly drowned her voice. And there we go. Tomorrow's chapter is How They Discovered Something Worth Knowing. Until then, bye-bye. <laughs>